Salter Harris fracture classification. Salter Harris fracture is a common injury in children that involves the growth plates. Here is the tibia and the fibula, and here are the growth plates. And here is an example of a fracture in the growth plate. 15% of all fractures in children involves the growth plate. It occurs more in boys than girls. The growth plate injuries occur more distal than proximal, such as distal radius, distal tibia, and distal phalanges. Here is a growth plate of the distal tibia. You can see the metaphysis and you can see the epiphysis. Growth plate injuries in children are common in the bones of the lower leg, tibia and fibula. It is important to diagnose these fractures as they may affect the growth of the bone if not diagnosed and treated properly. There are generally five types of Salter Harris fractures. The higher of the type number, the more complications associated with the fracture and the worse prognosis. Growth plates produce the longitudinal growth of bones. It is divided into zones. The first zone is called the reserve zone and it is inactive zone. Then the second zone is called the proliferating zone. And in this zone, cellular proliferation and longitudinal growth occurs. This is the zone that makes us taller or shorter. The next zone is the zone of hypertrophy, and it is divided into three sections. Maturation, degeneration, and provisional calcification. So there is a resting zone, inactive zone, and then the cells becomes active and it makes the proliferating zone. And then this cells gets bigger and the hypertrophy and Basically, that is the zone of hypertrophy. Then it mature, that zone of maturation. After maturation, it degenerate, and then it gets calcified because it's dead. It just gets calcified. Zone of provisional calcification. All these three stages are in the zone of hypertrophy. The majority of growth plate injuries occurs in the hypertrophy zone. This hypertrophy zone is weak. In fact, it is weaker than the ligaments and it provides a cleavage zone for the fracture to occur. Here are the five types of Salter-Harris fractures. Type 1 5% of the fractures are type 1. It may be difficult to diagnose. The fracture occurs through the growth plate and there may not be an obvious displacement. And sometimes the diagnosis is a clinical one. And the fracture occurs through the weak zone of provisional calcification. This fracture type is known by fast healing and rare complication rate. Type 2, fracture through the growth plate and the metaphysis, sparing the epiphysis. 75% of fractures are type 2. The corner of the metaphysis separates thruston holland sign. This fragment usually stays with the epiphysis while the rest of the metaphysis will displace. Healing is fast and the growth is usually okay. An injury to the distal femur will cause a high rate of growth abnormality. Type 3. Fracture through the growth plate and the epiphysis sparing the metaphysis. The fracture splits the epiphysis. 
10% of the fractures are type 3, and this fracture extends into the articular surface of the bone. It's an intra-articular fracture. It requires an atomic reduction of the joint and internal fixation. An example of that is a talo fracture of the distal tibia. You may need a CT scan to diagnose that fracture. Type 4 10% of fractures are type 4. The fracture passes through the epiphysis, the growth plate, and the metaphysis. Can cause complications such as growth, disturbances, and angular deformity. Type 5. It's uncommon. It's about 5%. It is a compression or crush injury of the growth plate. No associated fractures of the epiphysis or the metaphysis. The initial diagnosis may be difficult. It has the highest incidence of growth, arrest, and disturbance. Type 1 and 2 usually don't require surgery and will have a better prognosis than type 3, 4, and 5. In type 1 and 2, the reduction of the fracture may not be anatomic, and despite that, the prognosis is usually good. Type 3 and 4, the fracture is usually intra-articular, and anatomic reduction is necessary, so it does require surgery, and the prognosis is usually fair. Type 5 is rare and has a poor prognosis. What are the contribution of the growth plate in different anatomic areas to the longitudinal growth of bone? The proximal femur 30%, the distal femur is 70%. This growth plate is very important. The proximal tibia is 55%. And the distal tibia is 45%. Proximal humerus is 80% and distal humerus is 20%. The distal radius growth plate contribute approximately 75% of the growth of the radius. In general, the distal femur contributes approximately 9 to 10 mm of growth a year. The proximal tibia contribute approximately 6 mm of growth a year. Girls complete the growth at the age of 14. Boys complete the growth at the age of 16. Child abuse and growth plate injuries. In this situation, you may find growth plate injury or physial separation as you can see in transepiphyseal separation of the distal humerus in children. Thank you very much. I hope that was helpful.